Thank you, Professor, and thank you, Director, and, and thank you all for uh, having me join you. Uh, for me, it's this evening, and I guess for you, it's just coming up on the evening. I'm going to start sharing my screen, if I may. Um, what a wonderful opportunity to speak to you. Uh, when I thought about this, and I had the invitation, I think, perhaps in May or June of this year, um, I knew that the election results would be in, and uh, what better time to talk about the politics of space and so forth. So um, maybe start with some definitions tonight. Uh, politics is really nothing more than how people make decisions in groups. It's important to remember that because I think as architects, we can have influence on that. And from politics come policies, which are principles that guide our actions. I want to talk tonight about infrastructure because it is one of the areas in which architects can have enormous influence and where the political parties in the United States uh, have had in the past anyway, some agreement about the need to take action. One of the difficulties though, is that when people say infrastructure, they tend to mean things like this, highways, roads, bridges, Sometimes they'll talk about rail lines. Sometimes they will mention canals. But for the most part, uh, it is about highways and bridges. I want tonight to dwell on this principle that infrastructure really involves all of the basic systems of support for human activity and for uh, the way we live. Uh, as the new administration comes into office and as it grapples with all of the challenges that the United States faces, one of those is infrastructure. And I want to argue that we should be focused on infrastructure for the way we want to live, not uh, the way we have lived. Um, and that means adapting uh, our systems and the pieces of infrastructure that are remnants of another century to the way we live now. And I'll go into this in some detail. And it may mean um, moving to new systems of movement and transport. And I'll, I'll try to talk about that a little bit uh, during the evening. What are the conditions that infrastructure has to meet? Uh, well, I have three principles I wanna talk about. First of all, it has to be ample. Um, I have been, uh, talking with the International Canals Organization. It's an organization of cities and municipalities and in some cases states that own and operate canals, which had been used for industrial purposes and to move goods uh, in the last century and perhaps the century before, but have now become recreational uh, facilities. And one of the principles that applies is it has to be ample. It has to be substantial enough uh, that it is capable of uh, attracting people and being used for the purposes they have in mind. It can't not be a small uh, or just a, a piece of something, but rather is a, uh, a long and, and a substantial uh, piece of infrastructure. A second principle has to do with security and being free from danger and the threat of harm. And one of the principles that is as old as the field of security is the idea that when people are present, um, things are more secure. This is something Jane Jacobs uh, wrote about and, and uh, a man named Oscar Newman, an architect who worked in the 70s, clearly enunciated this principle that in general, when more people are present, uh, things are more secure. And finally, infrastructure has to be complete. It has to have all the necessary and appropriate parts. I want to talk just for a moment about uh, the proliferation of uh, scooters and dockless bicycling systems and uh, other forms of non-motorized transit, uh, some of them electric motors, but for the most part, non-motorized. Um, this has really become uh, a plague in many cities, the idea that we can have these dockless systems uh, and that simply dedicating a few paths and making the vehicles available will somehow improve conditions. Uh, in fact, though, what is required is a much more substantial investment 
Um, I'll take the example of the of Velib system here in Paris, which is a docked system, a very expensive system, uh, where every single bicycle has a unique identifier and it is um, tagged. And when it's docked, uh, the system knows that the bicycle has been returned to a particular station. The real expense in this system is in this area where you see the man touching the screen. Uh, you subscribe to the system. When you take a bicycle with a card, uh, it records the fact that you've taken a particular bicycle from a particular location. Uh, if you keep it for 30 minutes or less, there's no charge. If you keep it for more than that, the charges start uh, as a meter and they're relatively inexpensive. The system also records where you return the bicycle. So it's not an inexpensive investment and the docking system itself is very nicely made and, and a very sophisticated. Uh, for recreational cycling, uh, not commuter cycling, uh, there are more investments that are required, especially for mountain biking. If you, if you go to the areas where mountain biking is popular, uh, you start to see now investments being made in bicycle washing stations and other kinds of uh, investments that promote uh, the use of these areas for recreational and touristic purposes. To me, a principle that applies uh, for investments in infrastructure is uh, this question, does it make life better for many people rather than just a few? I have the great privilege of living in a city where for many years investments were made in public amenities and in public infrastructure that uh, can benefit all people and can be enjoyed by all people in different ages and ranges. And you still see remnants of the investments that were made now more than 120 years ago in simple things like benches, which were all part of a vocabulary that Baron Haussmann and his uh, sidekick, uh, Monsieur Alphonse developed, uh, benches and grates and tree grates, lamp posts, and a whole range of other things and we're just now coming into an era uh, in the city where similar moves are being made to try and, um, I will say, defeat the automobile uh, and try to balance the system so that uh, bicycles and pedestrians have a relatively even chance against the, the very dominant automobile. Uh, in the 1970s, the early 1970s, this entire area along the Seine in Paris was given over to automobiles. And now just, just last year, uh, one full lane of tra traffic has been taken and devoted to, to bicycles. And we're seeing these investments made in, in cities all over the place. Uh, this, this happens to be uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, uh, but you can find examples almost everywhere. And this too has to be uh, included in uh, the discussion of infrastructure and the investments we make. We have so many remnants um, of an industrial age that is now past, and uh, there are many vestiges of that, including many disused rail beds, and I'm sure you're familiar with uh, rail to trail investments that have been made, but those too require uh, more than simply making a path. There has to be some infrastructure attached to those. And in many cases, um, bridges, for example, over rivers uh, designed for automobiles, but without any attention to bicycles or pedestrians, are structurally redundant enough that uh, appendages can be tacked on after the fact, and paths and, and footpaths and bicycle paths can be added to existing structures without uh, requiring a major investment in, in new structural uh, engineering. I'm going to move away from uh, in, talking about infrastructure for just a moment. And I want to talk about three factors that I think will influence our world and us as architects and designers for the balance of our, our careers and perhaps our lifetimes. Um, the first one is, is, I think, familiar to anyone who is uh, in central Illinois. This happens to be a picture of Miami, Florida. And uh, you are very familiar in the Midwest, as I was, where I grew up with uh, phenomena like this. 
And we are seeing all over the globe, this happens to be Athens, Greece, uh, incidents of extreme weather that are really without precedent um, in, in modern times. And it's so usual now to see uh, situations where massive flooding has disrupted lives of thousands and thousands of people, and in some cases taken lives. The point is that the first factor uh, that will be with us, I think, for the foreseeable future is extreme weather. And that's true almost everywhere. I, last summer in France, the temperatures reached 108 degrees Fahrenheit. That has never happened before. This is not a city, uh, nor are many cities in Northern Europe designed to withstand those kind of temperatures. And uh, every indication is that we'll see more of that. This is starting to have uh, a profound effect as sea levels rise on places like the Eastern seaboard of the United States and the barrier reefs and on communities that have been settled uh, for centuries, which are now starting to be eroded and threatened. So that images of this kind are, are, are typical now uh, and very commonplace and almost something that, that people have come to expect. And it's not unreasonable to, uh, if you look at some of the predictions about sea level rises, to think about an urban future for some places that have been built on water that will be very, very challenging. So that's the first factor. The second factor has to do with the sheer number of people on our planet. If we have seven and a half billion people, at least one billion of those people are living in places that they build for themselves, uh, typically using scavenged materials on land that they uh, squat or settle uh, temporarily. Just to get some idea of what is a billion, um, if you saved $100 every day, it would take you almost 28,000 years to have a billion dollars. And if we look at the global planet of 7.5 million people, uh, we see the areas that have grown enormously, that are growing, and we see the relative impact, impact of populations uh, that have mushroomed and will continue to grow by all projections. So that scenes like this uh, from urban centers all over the globe, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere, but not only in the Southern Hemisphere, are, are very um, common. And we start to see cities taking on uh, the character of, of true division um, culturally and in every other way. Uh, here's an image of perhaps the largest slum in the world, certainly the largest slum in Africa. It's a place called Kibera in, in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, where as many as 2 million people live uh, in an informal settlement that is um, essentially built by hand with scavenged materials. So this second factor, um, the fact that so many people are fending for themselves, means that our cities have this very divided character uh, where some people are living in poverty while others are in wealth, where some people are educated where others are not, and so on and so forth. And I'll return to this. The point is that our urban centers are taking on the physical characteristics of these social, economic, ethnic, and cultural divisions, and something has to give. Of course, the third is with us now. That's why we're uh, meeting the way we are this evening. Uh, and this is a condition all over the world. We are beginning to see already, uh, I think, the physical impacts of pandemic, and this is only one pandemic, uh, we are constantly reminded. There is likely to be another uh, within our lifetimes. And we are starting to see this reflected in the way buildings are designed and marketed. Um, this is, uh, office space in Washington, DC, where uh, the design features that are supposed to produce uh, safer indoor air are being advertised out on the street uh, as we speak. In this interlude then, I want to say that we live in a world in need. And uh, you know, I, I gave a lecture this year to the Indian Institute of Architects and they wanted to celebrate uh, modernism and the fact that Le Corbusier had designed uh, 
a capital in India. And um, so I did some looking into uh, the origins of modernism. Le Corbusier grew up, as you know, I'm sure, in, in a fairly remote part of Switzerland. And this is a train station um, that existed when he was a young boy. And this is kind of what he grew up with as the architecture. And this is what things looked like in the area, era of his youth and his, he was coming up. This happens to be in Normandy in France, but it's very typical of, of the kind of style of high style that he would have seen and experienced. But he also experienced the devastation of war. And, um, and this is the First World War, which took a terrible human toll across Europe. And he and his generation were very profoundly impacted by that. And among other things at that time, as a reaction to war, uh, a movement began to resurrect uh, things like Esperanto, um, a language that was universal, uh, could be spoken by all people, and could overcome what were perceived to be uh, cultural and language barriers that led to the conditions of war that produced uh, the First World War. And in a similar vein, um, many of the principles and ideas that came out of the modernists at that time were a reaction to the conditions that existed in architecture and um, that were, in a sense, um, symbols of, of cultural difference and divisions, uh, ethnic and, and cultural divisions, and an attempt to um, sort of do away with those. Uh, some of you will know, I hope, about SIAM, uh, the first International Congress of Modern Architecture, of which Le Corbusier was a leading figure, among others, and a very influential figure for the life of the organization. Um, they produced idealized designs and principles and manifestos that were intended to sort of do away with the old um, ways that, that had produced a Europe that was at war, and to introduce new um, egalitarian places to live and to work and cities in which to live. And I mention it because it was really the first time uh, that in a modern sense, assertions were being made that architecture could actually do something to improve society. And the UIA grew out of that very conviction uh, at a time when uh, the world was recovering from yet another world war. Uh, the, the International Union of Architects was founded in Switzerland uh, 72 years ago. It's grown substantially since that time. And um, it too, though, grew out of uh, an era of need, uh, a very profound need at the time to rebuild a world that had been physically devastated and economically devastated by war. The first president of the UIA was Auguste Perret, um, who is the, considered to be uh, the father of reinforced structural concrete. But importantly, he was also the architect who led the rebuilding of Le Havre in France, a port that had been bombed essentially into oblivion by the, by the allied forces because the Germans had created a stronghold there. And so he uh, and his associates redesigned the entire city of Le Havre and did many of its principal buildings, which is now uh, listed on the UNESCO uh, World Heritage Site. Um, for many years, the UIA was lodged in Perret's old apartment after he uh, passed away uh, in a building that he and his brother designed where they both lived. Uh, but when the estate um, left uh, the hands of the Perret family and uh, moved on, well, we had to move to another uh, tall building. This one, the tallest in Paris, many think of it as the ugliest building in Paris. Um, and we're on the 47th floor with a commanding view. What has not changed in the 72 years since the UI was founded are the principles that it is supposed to achieve and the objectives, uh, which are listed here. I don't have to read them to you, I think. But it has reaffirmed, I think, and does so today 
forcefully this very idea that architecture can improve our condition and the condition of our planet. We, we see so much talk about sustainable architecture and sustainable design. And I think um, we're in an area now of the world where uh, it, it's more than that. It's, um, it's an urgent situation, it's acute. Uh, and I, I prefer terms like this to terms like sustainable, uh, because I think it implies better um, the challenge we face. And one of those challenges is the fact that so much of development in the world uh, is automobile dependent and is based on the use of land that either, either was uh, in agricultural use before or essentially natural um, land. And it's been a very destructive pattern of development. It is by no means confined to, to North America or the United States, uh, but you can find a photograph like this or a pattern of development like this almost everywhere in the world on the periphery of any major city. And when you think about the automobile, I, I hope you can read this from your screens. Um, this is some figures that came from a European foundation. 92% uh, of the time, a typical car in, in the European continent is parked. Uh, a quarter of the time it's driving, it's looking for parking. It's designed to seat five, but on average carries just one and a half. And something like 86% of the energy that is expended to move the thing actually reaches the wheels. And most of that is to move the car, not the people inside of it. So if you were setting out to design a transportation system and a mode of transportation that was efficient, that's probably the last place you would land. And that's one of the reasons why I think our profession and architecture and so many institutions in the world have embraced uh, UN Habitat's sustainable development goals. I, I hope and I, I'm confident that these are familiar to most of you or to many of you, uh, but essentially it's um, a commitment, an international commitment among the signatories to try and overcome some of the inequities, the inequalities, the injustices, the imbalances, and some of the difficulties that plague our planet and its cities. And I think um, if you're familiar with the goals, um, one of the challenges for architecture is to figure out, uh, rather than simply preaching about the fact that we have a problem or a set of problems, what it is architecture can do and design can do to help and address those problems. And so this guide that we've published with our colleagues in Denmark, um, is uh, essentially uh, intended to show examples of buildings and projects all over the world that address every single one of the 17 uh, sustainable development goals, taking into account conditions of climate, culture, economy, and other factors. And uh, I commend it to you. You can get to it through the UIA website. It's free of charge. It's available in PDF. And a second volume, a second edition has just been published um, by the uh, Architect Association of Denmark. Uh, and it's a wonderful resource for looking at projects uh, all over the world. So that's the end of the interlude that I wanted to introduce talking about these factors and a little bit about the UIA. I'm gonna return to infrastructure now. And the, the point I wanna make about what I think architects need to be talking about as a new administration comes into office in the United States and the sort of politics uh, of infrastructure. To me, um, infrastructure has to serve many, it has to be simple, it has to be flexible, it has to last, and it has to be sufficient. This wonderful little cartoon by Sampe, to me summarizes the idea of a public park um, that it's near where people live, you can walk to it. It's something that caters to the elderly, to the infirm and to the very young, and that has amenities and features that serve all of those purposes. It's a very simple idea. It's one that animated so many cities in North America. Your, your director was just in St. Louis. 
Uh, I hope he had a chance to go to the great park there that was designed by Frederick Law Olmsted and his uh, associate. Um, but it too embodies this urban principle that everyone should have access to a place that is um, enjoyable and caters to people of all abilities and ages. Um, and we have so many assets in our urban centers. This is Seoul, Korea and, and a former industrial channel that has now been given over to recreational use, enormously successful, accessible to so many people. And this too, uh, this kind of amenity and this kind of feature really should be considered part of our, um, of our infrastructure and the investments we need to make. I, I look at market spaces um, because we've had this movement, as, as I think you know, from uh, farm to table and the idea of eating food that is grown locally, that is healthier, uh, and that is something that contributes to the economy. And one of the great features of life in, in Paris and many other European cities is that there are so many uh, markets that spring up and they're very lightweight, um, but they're, they're equipped with the infrastructure that makes them possible. These very lightweight systems that are anchored in the ground, uh, if you can see my mouse, I'm circling around one now, uh, get delivered by truck, erected, simple shelters overneath that are expanded, but they have water available in them. And then there's a similar stanchion like this for electrical power. And so that when they're up and running, uh, they're a wonderful beehive of activity and a diverse set of products, most of them coming from very nearby, uh, as you can see here. But when they're done, it essentially disappears. We're seeing proposals uh, all across uh, the world now for ways to uh, try and convert these enormous investments that have been made in automobile space into space that can be used by people. Um, this, this happens to be uh, a proposal from Spain about converting uh, a street in front of a school uh, before and after and ways to accommodate um, uses that are different from parking and moving vehicles. And I think here is where architects can make such a contribution to investing in infrastructure for how we want to live, not how we once lived or, or perhaps are living now. And uh, in my work with the canals organization, I've come to realize that uh, part of the infrastructure investment is also in trees and in green space. Um, I want to uh, conclude my remarks by talking about the work of three architects, um, one of whom is Alejandro Aravena, known to you, I'm sure, from Chile. Um, and his work for housing Chilean copper miners. He understood and he knows that uh, from experience and looking around in Chile, that so many people build from themselves with scavenged materials when they can afford it in the manner that they choose. And that's what would have happened to these miners had Aravena not been retained to essentially build infrastructure for the housing that would ensure adequate sewage and water for each dwelling. And sure enough, over the years, what has happened is the people have built in the fashion that suits them with whatever materials they've been able to find. And in the end, um, you have a result that perhaps is not uh, let's say front cover material for architecture record, architectural record, or one of those, but is nonetheless architecture that has made an enormous difference in the lives of the people who uh, live there. A second architect I want to talk about is Francis Carré, uh, who is from Burkina Faso in Africa, a very different context, a very different set of challenges, but he too uh, recognizes the idea that people build for themselves with materials that are at hand. Um, and what he has done is teach his tribal community how to use what is at hand more effectively 
and to build better and, um, in a sense, uh, more successfully using material. Super. All Thank right, you. let's see if we can get through this. But my point in mentioning Bjork Engel's work is that um, he had the imaginative approach of an architect who thought about the problem differently than an engineer would and thought about infrastructure in a different way. And instead of building a giant seawall, what he built was a ring of recreational uh, flexible use space around the base of the island. This is what he's designed and portions of which are now being built, familiar to you, I'm sure. Uh, in which uh, space is used for recreational purposes when water levels are at their normal levels, but then uh, when sea levels rise and storm conditions arise, this becomes sacrificial uh, barrier essentially between the water and, and the buildings. Um, we're starting to see recognition, I think, politically of the value of making investments in uh, aging infrastructure, in some cases abandoned infrastructure. Uh, many of these investments have multiple benefits, uh, including not just increased tourism and uh, sort of the, the glitzy side of, of attractive um, amenities, but also basic things like improving irrigation and reducing flooding and protecting wetlands. I, pick the Erie Canal because it's something I'm somewhat familiar with, but there are many other examples, including some in Illinois. Um, when we think about infrastructure and we think about the politics of infrastructure, let's not forget that, yes, of course, roads and bridges are important, but here's a, a bridge, the, the uh, bridge built over the Beltway, uh, the Potomac River, north of the city of Washington, DC which is basically a piece of engineering that is designed to carry trucks and cars across a span of water and, and very little more. Um, it's basically a piece of structural engineering. About eight miles down river um, is the Memorial Bridge, uh, which, which goes from the Lincoln Memorial across the Potomac River to the Lee Mansion and Arlington National Cemetery. There's nothing that says that infrastructure of roads and bridges cannot be designed in a manner that makes them attractive and appealing and gives them the quality of architecture rather than simple, what I would call brutal engineering. And you certainly see this in infrastructure from another century, uh, particularly in Europe, but not only. We have many examples in the United States where engineering structures were given a certain architectural quality and where infrastructure investments were really intended to uh, make amenities for all people. Uh, I wanna conclude my remarks by coming back to this idea that architecture can improve the human condition and the condition of our planet. Politics is about making decisions in groups and policies are principles that guide our action. I think we need politics that involve architects and what they know how to do and the values and skills they bring uh, to discussions about infrastructure and our lobbying of a new administration um, and the investments it will make in infrastructure. And those politics should result in policies that um, guide our investments and our actions in this area. And, and I hope that um, some of you will move into practice situations and perhaps into situations where you have a voice in a community that will help uh, influence some of the decisions and investments we'll be making. Um, if you'd like to be in touch with me, this is how to do it. I'll give you my email address. Uh, if you want to take issue with any, anything I've said or you, you'd like to add, I'd be very, very happy to hear from you. Uh, Director Rodriguez, uh, Professor Boss, I'm very grateful to you for uh, the opportunity to speak. I hope that it's been uh, interesting for the people who've been kind enough to listen. I'm sorry for the interruptions. And I'd be happy to stand by if uh, there's any discussion. Thank you.